week. This is um, lateral uh, inner body fusion and, and how I do it. Uh, so a lot of the imaging um, and fluoroscopic um, awareness is similar. Um, with, with lateral surgery, we tend to default to the left side um, from a vascular and neural anatomy perspective. There just is a, a slightly larger corridor, but it's, it's a small influence. Uh, we do right-sided approaches all the time. It's more important for you to just look at the preoperative MRI and or CT and, and assess the vascular anatomy, particularly at L45 and, and the corridor that you have to work in. If there's a tilt at L45, that is a priority. Uh, that will influence things more than anything uh, to provide for an angle of approach to the L45 disc space. Uh, that, that same concept applies to the upper lumbar spine. If you have a very aggressive angle in a scully, you're gonna be ob obligated to go to one side versus the other out of uh, practicality and capability. The um, the other very important thing with laterals is to confirm the lack of substantial retroperitoneal uh, prior surgical or disease process on one or both sides. Um, things like uh, diverticulitis, uh, prior kidney surgery, um, uh, prior significant uh, retroperitoneal approach for vascular reasons or prior spine surgery all can affect this the ease with which you get through that corridor. So, Certainly when you are learning, um, you want to avoid revision scenarios in that, re that regard, or it can get very hairy. Uh, the preoperative graphs, you want to look at uh, the, the level of the pelvis. Uh, if they have a very deep L4-5 level relative to the crest, you want to be cautious with tackling that, particularly when you're novice or getting started with it. Uh, it can be very a deep angle can just be very, very challenging and you may um, choose a different approach, whether it's ALF or TLF because of that. And you'll you'll learn as you start um, working through some of this, the smaller and medium angles, how, how comfortable you feel with a deeper angle. Uh, here's a look at the, the scoliosis and the approach here is really obligated to the the. Um, the right side of the screen from the right side of the screen. Uh, so you can be working over the crest and you're going to work in the concavity of the curve. You're, you're not going to be able to get to L4-5 from this uh, convex side, if you will, convex of the primary curve. The relevant anatomy, obviously, um, on the approach or the retroperitoneal spaces, uh, the psoas muscle, the lumbar plexus and the vascular anatomy. Um, it, that varies depending on the level that you're working at. You can see here what normal versus transitional anatomy looks like. Um, transitional anatomy is not a no-go, but it's, a, it's one of those conditions that you have to be exceptionally cautious with. You have to know your skill set, and um, definitely um, this is not an area to move into when you're learning or, or have uh, just a few cases under your belt. You want to be uh, at a more confident level in your skill set, both from speed and awareness of, of what you feel like you can do, how you dock, um, stick, stick with the normal anatomy initially. The, the rationale for more challenge with transitional is the psoas you can see is moving forward and with it, the plexus tends to move forward. And so you just have a very small corridor with which or in which to work uh, safely. Uh, anesthesia is critical. You want to make sure they're using um, um, the proper anesthetic. They want it, it, the idea is to use succinylcholine preferentially and avoid non depolarizing blockade um, now, but you still want to be cautious not to, to use um, those non depolarizing competitive blockade because some people really metabolize it slowly. So you can, there were times initially where we'd sit around for an hour waiting for the stuff to wear off. It was very painful. So that discussion ahead of time is really important. So you can maintain a uh, good distal uh, electromyography um, assessment. The Florotex uh, ideally are there. Uh, that's obviously quite a challenge uh, for many of us in the system and, and outside that but they are far more critical in their uh, 
their capabilities for this sort of procedure. So having them trained and, and knowing what your needs are ahead of time and being there uh, before you're ready to start is, a, is an asset. And then the OR staff needs to be there. This is the setup. It's easier to have the fluoro on the far side of the patient uh, because the intensifier, once you roll onto the lateral uh, position with, or I'm sorry, the AP positioning, but the, the CR is in a, what you would typically think of lateral, but under the patient or across the patient, getting an AP view will be in your way more if it is coming in from the patient's backside. The reality is we just sort of do it um, in the manner in which the, the, the room is best set up uh, relative to entry door. Uh, but it, you know, if you have your druthers, if you could set it up anyway, this is a little easier ergonomically for the primary surgeon who tends to be working on the dorsal side of the patient. You want to uh, place the patient on a regular table with a break typically around the greater trochanter. Um, uh, and then you want to tape the patient. Uh, taping typically is over the trochanter uh, down. And I'll show you a, a look at that. Um, so tape is over the trochanter, down the thigh, under the table, and over the, the leg, as you see here. And then another one at the chest. Uh, you want to tape before you opt to do any breaking of the table or flexing of the table. Um, as you, you know, we, we tend not to break the table very much. We used to do that a lot more because we didn't have instruments that could work at an angle. Um, although we're not totally sure uh, from a scientific perspective, we are largely anecdotally, um, I won't say certain, but uh, convinced that the significant breaking of the table with flexion of the uh, table, tensioning the psoas muscle and the lumbar plexus, there, there's likely more um, uh, physical challenge and injury challenge to both the musculature and the, the neural elements in that process. Although we don't have convincing scientific evidence that it is, um, it is clinically meaningful postoperatively, when volunteers were placed in that position for even a short period of time, they became significantly symptomatic. So generally speaking, we don't break for those two reasons um, and unless we absolutely need to. If you wanna get a pure AP and a pure lateral view, you can see the AP view. I won't belabor that because we just talked about it is that bisected interpedicular distance with the uh, spinous process and on -foss uh, view of the end plates. You want to move the table to find this view. You do not want to have the C-arm and Fluorotech adjusting their platform. The rationale for that is you want them in a very simple transition, 90 degrees from one view to the other and not having to reinvent the wheel with cant and tilt and rainbow every time because you end up taking more fluoro and you take a lot more time in the midst of the procedure, particularly with your retractor open. So move, arrange the table, meaning tilt the table, Trendelenburg the table, however you need to, to get these perfect views with the C-arm uh, in uh, initially in the AP view like this. And then you wanna get a lateral view um, with a perfect view of the pedicle superimposed and on fast view of the end plates. Remember with a tilted uh, uh, interspace, you may have a lack of on fast view as you see on the bottom right. This says incorrect, but it may be correct if you have an asymmetric tilt of the disc space. The C arm should come in favoring the segments lordosis or the lordosis of the lumbar spine. As an example, down at L45, the C arm is gonna come in on the red line. At L23, R12, it's gonna come in line with the green line. So that's the, the way you want their base to come in and they're gonna roll under the table in the AP view in that view for that view. And then they're gonna uh, go to 90 degrees from that for the lateral view, but you wanna keep their base parallel with these lines of approach for each particular level. Um, once your uh, AP view is done, you do your lateral view. Um, and as you see here, marking out uh, the uh, psoas muscle, or I'm sorry, the uh, paraspinal muscles, the rib, you can see the pelvis line here. There's a soft spot in the midst of that triangle. 
And there's also marking the uh, position in which you incise. Uh, so the lateral incision is gonna be in this neck of the woods. Uh, for those who wanna do a two incision technique, as I said, you're gonna make an incision that is in the soft spot within this triangle. And you put that incision also in, in a place that your finger can reach from that incision on top of the skin to the lateral incision, which is your, uh, your proxy for knowing that you're gonna be able to reach internally from that incision to the inside of the incision laterally. All right, so here's the posterior incision. And then he's making a lateral incision. You're going that lateral, the posterior incision initially using blunt dissection uh, and transgressing these three structures, you get a, a very, uh, usually a typically clear entry through the transverses, which is more rigid to a soft or giving way, a very low pressure environment of the retroperitoneal space. And you should be able to fill the inside of the pelvis, inside of the rib. And uh, hopefully uh, they're not a, a huge patient. And in that case, you can usually fill the transverse process and the psoas muscle through the posterior incision. Do not use electrocautery for lateral muscle dissection because you may bag some of these important nerves in the, um, uh, that innervate these muscle groups. And if you do violate them uh, with cautery, you can create a, a pseudo hernia, uh, which is not well liked by patients. So you want to use blood dissection alone. Once you have both incisions carried out, um, you guide your dilator down, um, typically aiming for uh, slightly anterior. Um, at L4-5, uh, I would aim in this case for even farther anterior through the psoas and then and maybe a bit cephalad to avoid the lumbar plexus, which is moving this way. Uh, get in front of it and then drag back once you're through. Uh, once you're docked and you've done your, your stimulation and guide wire placement, as well as dilation, you wanna place your retractor. Uh, typically, this is a good look at the uh, a good retractor placement so that you have ample space to do your discectomy and open ventrally after you've placed your, uh, your fixation of the posterior blade, if that's the apparatus you're using. Here's a look at a, an angular approach at L4-5. Um, that means Cobb first. You can see there, uh, here's a box cutter. Uh, I tend not to use that very often. I use uh, mainly the Cobb debulk and then trial. Once you've trialed, you give, you give the tech your sizes uh, and they start getting your cage ready and then you can finalize your end plate uh, preparation as you see on the left. And you can place your final implant. This is an old school peak implant. But the efficiency is king. Um, these are the steps you wanna take to be highly efficient, uh, aiming for no more than 20 to 25 minutes of, of disc prep and implant placement time. You wanna do your annulotomy. Um, technically, I like that to be two vertical cuts first, uh, one ventral, one posterior, leaving a small cuff in front of the shim, uh, one millimeter, two millimeter, millimeters to prevent the retractor assembly from sliding forward. So two vertical cuts to define the 15 to 20 millimeters of space you need to do your work. Uh, and then cut right along the end plates once you've done that from anterior to posterior. Then you go straight to your Cobb elevator. It's tempting to go to the pituitary, but, but you don't need to do that. Um, you can save time by going straight to the Cobb. You delaminate the disc off of the end plates, cephalad and caudad, then go to your pituitary and debulk the majority of the disc, but do not worry about the end plates. After you've debulked, you trial. And uh, as I said, give the size of chosen implant to your rep and tech, have them prep. Uh, they'll usually take a few minutes to do that. And those are the minutes that you will use to prepare the end plates with uh, scraping, 
curetting, whatever you need to do to get them ready and finally rasping and then implant the, the, uh, the cage. Um, irrigation is ideal at some point during that time. Uh, you wanna make sure you have hemostasis as your hemostasis can be less than obvious unless you bleed while you're doing the uh, discectomy. Sometimes you'll get bleeding um, as you bring the retractor down. So before you draw the retractor back, take the, take the retractor down in, in its uh, aperture, uh, which basically removes tamponade effect. If you have bleeding, then you can chase it down. The next step is to loosen your retractor assembly and bring it back a millimeter or two. Sometimes you'll get tamponade retractor sitting on a van. So make sure you drop back a millimeter or two and freeze give it a chance to bleed. If you see bleeding, then you can go after it without having lost sight of things or having come all the way out of the psoas. If you have no bleeding after either of those two steps, in both cases, you've given it a few seconds to declare itself and you can slowly drag everything back. Topical steroids are optional. Um, uh, there's some consideration they may help. Uh, you know, I, I can't speak to whether that scientifically makes a huge difference or there's an escalation in risk of infection, um, but it has worked in some hands and there's been some abstract uh, presentation that may help. Topical anesthetics are also have also been discussed, um, uh, still I would say yet not completely proven to be effective. Um, some people use drains reasonably and, and uh, yet again there's no scientific evidence that you must use those, uh, but the argument is that you know that you're bleeding if you have one in, and there's one, there was one paper presented uh, several years ago that suggested there was less post-op pain, something to consider, uh, and then wound inspection as you're removing the retractor. So follow the steps. Uh, the critical part of positioning is different in this case than what you do posteriorly. Don't break the table at all if you don't need it, and certainly don't overbreak it. Um, try to single pass through the psoas without uh, Swiss cheesing the psoas. That probably makes a difference. Uh, directional neural monitoring helps and understand how that works and why we use it. Um, minimize the retractor opening for the, uh, the amount that you need, but no more. Um, rather than breaking the table, utilize angled instruments and then be very adherent to that recipe for efficient retraction time. Uh, which is the single most critical factor to uh, related to or associated with postoperative uh, neurologic and or uh, pain issues. Thank you. Sorry, that was a whirlwind, but I wanted to let you guys see that as well since Greg didn't have time to do it last week. Any questions before we break? That's great, Bob. They talk. Thank you. You bet. So, have you ever tried topical steroids like Depometrol or something I, I, like that? Yeah, I think I did once or twice. I mean, anecdotally, I, I didn't know see any difference, but they, you know, people have used it, and some people swear by it. And I, if I recall, there was somebody who presented something on it and said that they found less less pain issues. But I still worry a little bit about um, infection risk, just like we saw in and decompressions and frankly healing a little bit and drain you don't leave them routinely right i, I don't, don't i think, think i think rough does leave. some people do um I, you know i i have not done it and um yet yeah, i'm still a little bit a, a little bit um interested in that one paper that's not really been followed up that showed that maybe there was less pain postoperatively with it Anybody Jamie, else? do those drains tend to put much out? Yeah, I'm jumping in. Uh, it depends. No, they usually don't. <clears throat> but I put them in because you don't know. And sometimes you'll have an ongoing ooze into the psoas. And even a small psoas hematoma, in my opinion, is painful. <clears throat> so I just have been putting them in routinely ever since I had a big one. With no issues. I mean, they don't really cause any problems. Yeah. I'm losing. I lost you, Hanny. Any reason you don't like to use the box cutter? Yeah, the box. So number one, the box. Um, 
it, it, it's a little bit dangerous. <laughs> it can, you need more space to get it in generally. So they're usually, um, I believe, I mean, you can use the smaller ones like the thoracic, but they tend to be um, squared off at the tip. And so you need more, more uh, A to P dimension to get them in than what you really need for your cage. You can make a 15, 18 millimeter annulotomy and do all your work through that. If you don't use the box cutter, you do the box cutter, you need more space. That's issue one. Issue two is it, because of that, it usually removes one of two things that you want to, to retain. It either removes the, the little cuff you've left on the backside to, to keep your retractor assembly from shifting forward or it, it, in a more sinister way, it can sneak around the front and take out the ALL. Those are both risks um, that are much higher with the box cutter than any other tool in the bag. And if you use the cobs well to delaminate the disc, I just find the box cutter is not all that helpful in any way. So between those risks and the lack of real additive assistance from them, uh, it just hasn't been a tool that I felt warrants much of my attention. The one place where I, I will occasionally, very rarely use it is a really tall, healthy disc, which frankly, we're not operating on very much, <laughs> you know, because it Got just it. can debulk it very rapidly. Got it. Anyone else? All right. Well, thanks, folks. Sorry for the long uh, one today, but uh, glad we got to both of them in.